Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Toronto Geometry Colloquium Season Two. 2020 has been difficult, and we thank everyone for being with us. Now look at 2021, and we renewed Toronto Geometry Colloquium for another season. So this is a weekly web series all about geometry processing. This curriculum aims at promoting young researchers and researchers from traditionally underrepresented communities. Every week, we will have an opener talking about their cutting-edge research for ten minutes, followed by a headliner giving us a keynote presentation. And before we start our colloquium today, I would like to share a great news for young researchers. So let me share my screen. So. So this、uh, this year,、um, there's a great opportunity called the Summer Geometry Institute, and and this is a summer research program,、uh, and no background is required, so everyone's welcome to apply. And in this program, you are going to learn some fundamentals in geometry processing, and also have some hands-on experiences working on the actual research project with like leading professors in our field. And just to remind you guys that the application deadline. In in two weeks, I will strongly encourage young students to take a look at this program and through the link here. And I also post the link later on the YouTube live chat. And I believe it will be a super fun experience. So let's go back to our colloquium itself. So our first speaker combo for season two includes Marie Julie、uh, Rocco Tosalna、uh, to talk about the intrinsic point cloud interpolation. Via dual latent space navigation, and also Yifan Wang for detail-driven 3D content creation. And as usual, if you have any questions,、uh, please leave comments in the YouTube or our newly created、uh, Discord channel. First,、uh, it's my great great pleasure to introduce Marie Julie. She is a PhD student at Eco Polytechnic in France and supervised by Professor Max Ofjanikov. And、her research belongs to the field of geometric deep learning, and she has experience in many different topics, such as like point cloud cleaning or learning correspondences between a pair of shapes. And today, she will be talking about her recent work published at ECCV 2020 on how to use machine learning to interpolate point clouds while preserving the structure and the intrinsic information of the shape. So please join me to welcome Marie Julie. So thank you for the introduction. I will now share my screen. Okay, so if you can see my screen, I will start. This is our work from ECCV 2020, and it's about intrinsic point cloud interpolation. It's a joint work with、uh, Max Ovjanikov, who is my PhD advisor. So the problem we are interested in is given two point clouds that are not necessarily in correspondence and don't necessarily have the same number of points. We want to interpolate them in a realistic way. So there are two main approaches to this kind of problems. One is from geometry processing. So the main idea is that you will want to find a geodesic paths in the shape in the space of shape. Or find paths that minimize some given energy. The、um, good aspect of this kind of method is that、uh, you minimize a loss that is、uh, theoretically well founded, and you have some、um, guarantees on intrinsic properties, for example, during your interpolation. However, you need meshes that are in one-to-one -one correspondence, and this is not necessarily applicable to this、uh, problem that we have. So we are also looking at learning-based methods. So in these methods, you can input point clouds and get a reconstruction of your point cloud or a corresponding surface as its output. You can often do interpolation by、uh, interpolating the latent space representations. So here is the typical architecture of these methods. You have a point cloud as input, and you can encode them into a latent vector. So this is a small vector that represents information about your shape. 
From that vector, you can decode it into a set of points or a surface depending on the method. So these methods provide quite good quality of reconstruction. So this will be the gray shapes, for example. But because you don't encode any intrinsic information about the shape, uh, the information of the underlying surface is not well encoded. And when you do linear interpolation of the latent vectors, you have um, high levels of distortions like you, you can see here. So in our work, we are interested in using the generative power from this kind of learning-based method, but we don't necessarily want to use this linear interpolation of the latent vectors. So what we want to do is to find a path in the latent space that will um, give you some properties on um, intrinsic metric preservation, for example. So for this, we will use in particular EDOS from the Geometric Modeling in Shape Space paper. The idea of the paper is that you can minimize the edge length variation of the mesh during the interpolation. And it is quite an intuitive idea that if you have a good interpolation of a mesh, the edges would be quite rigid during the interpolation. So this loss gives you a theoretical guarantee on preserving the intrinsic shape metric, but you still need one-to-one -one correspondences, which we don't have for point clouds. So we want to explicitly use this um, intrinsic information to find paths so that we com can combine the learning-based methods with this um, geometry processing loss. So in our pipeline, we first start with a simple autoencoder. We can encode a point cloud that is not ordered in any way with a point net based encoder into a small latent vector. And then we decode a set of points that are ordered so that we can use a fixed template. So we have a connectivity and we can access the surface of the mesh. So now that we have this encoder that contains um, that can reconstruct shapes. We also want to encode intrinsic information explicitly. And for this, we will use a separate autoencoder that encodes edge length from the fixed template. So this encoder is also a very simple architecture where you have a encoder, which is an MLP. So you encode the edges that are ordered and you decode the edges in the same order. So the latent vector here will characterize the shape, but in an intrinsic way. So you can still reconstruct the shape, but it also contains intrinsic information about the shape. And uh, I want to note that while at training time, we need um, edges that are aligned here. We will not use those at test time. So it's not a limitation of our method. So now that we have intrinsic information and can also um, reconstruct shapes, we want to make a direct link between the two. So for this, we build these translation networks that translate elements from the latent space of an autoencoder to another element that corresponds in the other latent space of the other autoencoder. So, um, now let's see how we use it in practice. So we have our two latent spaces and networks that can allow us to do the translation between the two. So we start with two shapes, a um, source and target shape. We can encode them. So normally in our shape latent space, and then we can translate them into the edge length autoencoder latent space. And now, we want to do linear interpolation in the edge length autoencoder latent space. And this will enable us to minimize our edge length variation loss over time. And finally, we can just decode and also translate back the uh, latent representations to get our interpolation. So we can also use our pipeline for a simple reconstruction. So let's say that you have a noisy point cloud, you can uh, project it into the edge length 
auto encoder latent space so that you get some kind of uh, regularization on your construction of the point cloud. So we train and test our pipeline on the surreal and also small data set. So now I will show some results of interpolation. Here we see um, different learning based methods and I show in red the distance to the edge length linear interpolation and it also corresponds to um, distortions of the shape and you can see that ours are less uh, distortions than other learning based methods. Um, I can also show results from the small data set. So here we compare with just a simple autoencoder of point net. And you can see that the front legs, for example, are quite um, distorted during the linear interpolation, while ours is more robust. And finally, I also wanted to show some results of a reconstruction of noisy point cloud. So the noisy point cloud as input is the blue column. And you can see that it's quite noisy, but our method, which is the middle column, can reconstruct the shapes with less distortion than other learning based methods. So finally, we have this method that allows us to find better paths in the latent space and respect some intrinsic information or properties of the shape. Our code and dataset are available online. And uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you for the great talk. And I especially, I like the renderings in your slides. And oh, thank you. <laughs> as usual. <laughs> And we will proceed to the talk of our headliner and have a joint Q&A session near the end. So our headliner, Yifang Wang, is a PhD student at ETH Zurich, supervised by Ogar Sorkin Cornyn. And she's another expert in geometric deep learning. And her contribution spans a lot of different representations that people used in this area. For instance, uh, she presented one of the first differential renderer for point clouds. And also for discrete mesh representation, she also combines ideas from classic cage-based deformation uh, with machine learning so that the model will be able to know how to preserve the geometric details during the deformation. And she's also the recipient of several awards such as like Apple Fellowship and Facebook Fellowship. So without further ado, please join me to welcome Yifang to talk about uh, detail-driven 3D content creation. Um, thank you, thank you, Derek. You're um, uh, well, you're making me blush. <laughs> I just want to correct one thing. I definitely didn't receive several awards and the Facebook awards is, uh, I didn't receive it. I was just one of the, you know, final nominees. So yes, uh, and actually congratulations to the, to the actual receivers. <laughs> um, okay, so I share my screen. Right. Um, Okay, first of all, I wanna say that I'm really honored to be here to share the stage uh, with fellow brilliant researchers. Today, I'm going to introduce some techniques that we developed in the past few years for uh, the reconstruction of detailed 3D contents. Um, so 3D content can be acquired from the real world or created from 3D modeling in softwares. Um, but either way, capturing and creating realistic, fine-looking, uh, fine-grained geometric detail is very difficult. Um, on the acquisition side, the acquired geometry is usually um, constrained or the quality of them is constrained by the um, hardware limitations, as well as some under-constrained acquisition environment. So having these imperfect acquired data, um, it requires us, um, or it gives actually demand to a lot of downstream geometry processing techniques. Um, I listed several here. And um, it's 
uh, it's uh, important to know that all of these downstream methods must deal with ambiguity and also it has they all benefits uh, benefit from some geometric priors. Um, on the geometry 3D modeling hand um, side, first of all, despite of some uh, very brilliant recent uh, advances to make this 3D modeling more intuitive, 3D modeling is still quite uh, laborious and it's also prohibitive to novice users. And the most important thing is that it's very, it's not scalable. So um, in order to produce more result in an automatic, automatic way, uh, it's still, we still need to do a lot of work there. So during the PhD, I've been engaged in improving the quality of both captured geometry, as well as in facilitating and even maybe try to automate the creation of high resolution 3D shapes. Um, in the next 45 minutes or so, I will try to walk you through hopefully all of them. Okay, so the very first project I want to introduce is deep point set up sampling. And I hope to convince you with this project that uh, deep neural networks are indeed a great tool to replace some established geometry processing methods. And in particular, with carefully designed network architecture, we can have a huge impact on the quality of the outcome. The goal of this project is to reveal fine grained details from unoriented point clouds, even for high upsampling ratios, and for in particular, very sparse inputs. If we look at previous optimization-based classic point upsampling methods, they typically rely on some handcrafted priors and they can focus on sharp, creating sharp features, but they tend to over-smooth the point cloud without when, when there is no strong cues from the point normals. And this motivates us to learn more, the, uh, more descriptive geometry priors using data that we learn from neural net networks. Um, so there are already deep methods to do this task, but looking at the previous methods, we realized that the output actually degenerates quite fast when we increase the upsampling ratio and also when we make the input increasingly more sparse. So um, if we so think about this problem, a naive solution to this observation could be that we can maybe augment the training data with more sparse inputs, or we can, uh, well, for in order to arrive at a higher upsampling ratio, we could probably apply the same network um, multiple times in an iterative fashion to achieve the high upsampling ratio. But our tests show that neither of these approaches yields satisfying results. And this is most likely due to uh, limited network capacity when it needs to handle a big variation in the inputs. And it could also, uh, in terms uh, of the iterative approach, it could be because of the error accumulation from the previous iterative steps. So um, how do we address these um, problems and challenges? Our key idea is to learn geometry information from multiple scales. And for that, we need to design a multi-step um, patch-based upsampling scheme. And the core idea is that there is an adaptive receptive field. So that um, when we focus on more um, large scale geometry, we have a larger context that gives us information. And when we want to refine the more fine grained details, we focus on rather local information. Um, actually applying directly this idea to existing, um, existing deep works already gives us quite a big improvement, a visual, a visibly uh, visible improvement. And this is uh, because with this different scales, we are able to capture global information from the courses level. Um, but you can still see 
um, there are some artifacts in this uh, upsampled result. And this is mainly because there are still some accumulative errors from the previous steps. Um, but this can be actually alleviated quite easily by training the all the levels jointly in a progressive fashion. And here we can see that in this tour example, the result is uh, uh, definitely correlates to the um, to the desired output, the number four. Okay, so from here we ask ourselves, can we do even better? And so yes, it turns out actually by fine tuning the network design, incorporating some state of the art network architecture ideas from other domains, we can actually further boost the upsampling accuracy by a quite a large margin. So here I will briefly mention a few things that are quite important for our networks. Uh, the first thing is, uh, instead of sequentially layer by layer get the features, we apply the um, concatenation, feature concatenation from previous all the previous layers as suggested by DenseNet, which is originally designed for discriminative tasks in image domain. And we can use this method to achieve a substantial improvement in performance. Another example is, is to use a dynamic learnable neighborhood to extract the information, the point per point features, instead of a fixed spatial information. This is proposed in dynamic graph convolution for point cloud classification. And then finally, um, to expand the idea of the previously mentioned dense connectivity, we create an interlevel dense feature that basically propagates the features from a previously a core, a extracted course level to the current point in this uh, final level. This contributes to also a considerable improvement in app sampling quality. Okay, now um, with all these techniques combined together, now let's look at some results. First, uh, the proposed method both the ability to handle extremely sparse point cloud and recover correct topology without normal information. And then if we look at uh, slightly what, rather denser inputs, we also significantly outperform uh, previous classic and the deep methods in terms of detail reconstruction. It's worth mentioning that the proposed method can be directly applied on real scan data as well, you're on this Android model. Okay, so actually that was uh, one of my first PhD projects. And I was quite happy to see that there are actually many follow up works in this direction. Some worth mentioning are quite, you know, very exciting, including, um, you know, well, basically incorporating GAN model or generative models to synthesize now details, just like um, people do in the image super resolution. And um, also there are some work that address the irregularity in the input point sampling to filling holes and some and other directions include um, exploit more explicitly the geometry prior such as contour, et cetera. Okay, so hopefully I was able to convince you that deep priors learned from a vast pool of data can help surpass state-of-the-art classic geometry processing methods in terms of detail reconstruction. But it must be said that 2D deep priors are easier to learn than 3D, mostly because the amount of data available and also um, and quite importantly, because unlike 3D content, 2D images, they live in a uni, usually represented in a unit, they have a unified representation using a 2D grid. Um, so then we need to ask ourselves, is it, possible, is it possible to use this vast existing image data and um, the abundant neural image processing techniques for detailed driven geometry processing? And the answer is yes. And the key word here is inverse rendering, which leads us to the second project I want to talk about. 
So in the second project, uh, I'm going to talk about a differentiable renderer that we proposed in CGRAB Asia. It's done in collaboration with Disney Research. Before we start, just please bear, me, bear with me to go back to the basics um, to talk about what is inverse rendering. So inverse rendering aims at inferring the underlying scene parameters, such as cameras, lighting, camera position, camera intrinsic, extrinsics, lighting parameters and materials, as well as the 3D geometry of the scene from the image itself. And the key is the gradient of the rendering function with respect to the scene parameters. And this is the reason why differentiable render is an extremely hot topic. And in this work, we proposed a point differentiable renderer. And um, so in this example, you see that you have, first of all, a 3D point cloud of a kangaroo. And then as a reference, you have images of a koala bear. And this differentiable renderer we proposed would update the point positions, the, the per point positions, the normals, and finally the point colors, so that in the end, the point cloud can be rendered to match these observation, 2D observations. Um, to be fair, there are plenty of different, differentiable renderers um, that can update the geometry. And they can typically be divided into two groups. The first one is using some volumetric representation. Um, the problem there is rather computational demanding. And on the other hand, we also have meshes. And the problem with the meshes is that, is that they have a fixed topology. Um, just to illustrate the difference um, between mesh and points, we deform a sphere to match the render of a teapot. And because of fixed connectivity, the existing mesh differentiable renders could not create this, um, this change the genus zero from genus one. And this, is, um, this shows that with the flexibility of point representation, we can actually do something like this. Now let's talk about the actual you know, implementation of this differentiable renderer. First, the forward rendering is, um, is based on elliptical weighted average, which renders a point in a space as an elliptic on the image. Now the inverse rendering part, we're looking for the gradient. But if we consider a pixel value at position X as a function of the, posi uh, the point position P, we can see that this function is actually discontinuous. Um, which means that our task lies in defining a reasonable gradient despite this discontinuity. Of course, this is a common problem for all rasterizers. Um, so we took inspiration from neural mesh renderer it is a mesh-based differentiable rasterizer based uh, or proposed in 2018. The principle is to approximate this discontinuous function as a linear one. And then the gradient at this point is simply the slope of this linear, linear function. And then as you can see, if the point moves closer to the, to the, um, the pixel we are considering, the gradient norm, the norm of the gradient increases, which also means that um, pixels or, which are closer to the projected position of my point will have a larger impact um, in terms of the gradient. Okay, so with this design, uh, this kind of uh, illustration into 1D and one point only, we can now expand or generalize this, uh, this into a 3D and multi-point scenario. Um, first, the, uh, the gradient is defined as the ratio between the change of pixel intensity um, and the change of point position. And depending on the occlusion and other points in the scene space, we considered three scenarios. 
Um, for the first, uh, for the sake of time, I'd like to refer the audience to the paper for the details of the each each of these three scenarios. Or if we have time, we can go back to them later after the talk. But for now, let me just go to the next component, uh, key component in the in the defining a point cloud, which is the normals of the point. Um, so unlike point positions, normals are actually used in the rendering function directly in the shading part, which is a differentiable function. And we can simply just derive the gradient in a, in a uh, typical, in a conventional way. And during the optimization, then we can update the position and normals of the points in an alternating fashion. And this process in action looks like this. Oopsie. Okay, so points have no hardwired connectivity, which is the reason that they have the flexibility to undergo large deformation without topological constraints. But it also raises some um, optimization challenges that we need to address. The first challenge you see is here in showing this picture. Um, it's basically the existence of inner points because so far in the formulation, there is no guarantee that the points form a surface. And especially problematic is the occluded inner points because they receive no gradients and they are simply a waste of resources. Another challenge is local minima. Um, as you can see here, what's happening is that um, the gradients coming from different image areas will cancel out. And because there is no incentive for the points to not overlap with each other, they would cluster in the center. So this um, propelled us to come up with this regularization. And we, the regularization we formulized is as follows. So if we consider this red point, which is currently occluded, um, we first, formulate or uh, build a local PCA plane from its neighbors weighted by the neighbor's visibility. And then we minimize the point to plane distance as well as at the same time, maximize the projected point to point distance. Um, these two terms what, uh, respectively encourage the points to distribute what well, first form a local plane and then distribute uniformly on this local plane. Now, these two terms combined together makes a very big um, difference in the final optimization result. Okay. Now let's back to the original quest to leverage the advantage of neural image processing networks for geometry processing. And with the differentiable neural network or differentiable renderer, we can now apply um, advanced neural image processing networks to classical geometry processing tasks. And one of the tasks we showed in the paper is point cloud denoising from image denoising. So what we first did is that we trained a image, a pix to pix network in this gray shown here in the gray. Uh, we pre-trained it offline using render images. And this is, um, you can see that the, in these examples, the denoised image, they have, a, you know, they are, they are definitely more, there's more detail and both hallucinating and using this um, pix, uh, pix to pix generative power um, and also quite stable because it's a condition on these, you know, the cycle um, construction of peaks to peaks. And then once we have this print train network, uh, we can, what we can do is that taking a new, uh, another unseen point cloud, that a noisy point cloud, we can then use this differentiable render that we, uh, we proposed 
to render different parts of the point cloud and then denoise it with this uh, pre-trained 2D image networks, denoising networks. And then this change in the image domain, this denoising process in an image domain can be then back propagated um, through this differentiable renderer to the input point cloud. So the result uh, is this. So we can see that uh, image-based approach here on the right is able to reconstruct surface details even when there is, uh, even when the input is very noisy. And this is, uh, imagine there is, uh, you know, we can probably do even more things because uh, we can, uh, we can, you know, apply even um, maybe more generative, gen generative methods in the image domain to create maybe hallucinate new patterns and then create it also on uh, translated, uh, transfer it back to the, the point base space. And also I would like to add that this approach can also be applied to real scan data. Um, here is the some, well, the result and scanned for this cute dragon. Um, of course, we can also use the differentiable renderer without using the neural image neural networks. For example, similar as the paparazzi paper um, proposed, written by one and only Derek, um, we have um, we can also apply image filters um, and then apply so use the deep uh, differentiable renderer to transfer these filtering result back to the point cloud. And then here you see the, you know, if we run Poisson reconstruction on point cloud, we get this effect on the mesh as well. So in summary, um, we proposed uh, a point-based differentiable render in this work, and it allows both large um, deformation and topological changes. The entire pipeline was uh, integrated in PyTorch on GPU, so that it can be work used together with 2D neural networks. And finally, I would like to say that after this work, there are some recent development on point rendering, uh, mostly based on soft rasterization, and actually quite interesting, mainly coming from the computer vision community. Um, the difference between these new works with ours typically lie in the forward rendering pass, where um, later works simplify this uh, EWA process that we use. Um, typically they render each point just as a disk and there, so there is no splatting involved and which means that the normal of the point doesn't, doesn't change the, the, the size or the shape of the point that uh, projected onto the image, which may cause some unrealistic rendering artifact. Um, so these works and typically are typically combined with neural rendering to compensate. Uh, that being said also, um, because of the soft rasterization um, definition, uh, meaning that, okay, the, the boundary of the point is a blurring, is blurred. Uh, this makes, well, on one hand, the gradient, um, naturally differentiable, but on the other hand, it comes at a cost that gradients are local, which means that the um, deformations are usually typically small. Um, but on the other hand, they, this allows faster um, def uh, optimization and is uh, in some applications quite sufficient. And we see some quite uh, amazing results from coming from this area as well. And um, so very excitingly, um, there are incredible advances in differentiable rendering directly from implicit surfaces. And actually in the colloquium, we have seen previously talks from Yarif. And um, so that we, uh, we still have to say that the rendering differentiable implicit surfaces are usually quite expensive. Um, but actually in the next project I will show you, uh, we will see how we can combine the point idea into these implicit functions to make this um, differentiable implicit function renderers more um, accessible. Okay, so that's a 
you know, a self introduction to the to the next project. Um, this is a new submission, and here we explored so called ISO points. So let me give you some kind of motivation how why we want to propose this ISO points. Um, so first of all, we've seen that many recent works have demonstrated that implicit functions can represent surfaces with arbitrary resolution and topology and achieve really impressive details where explicit representation usually struggle. But on the other hand, explicit representation have some irreplaceable advantages as well. And the main one being that they are usually the common input forms for geometry processing and shear modeling, which makes them easier to manipulate and also easier to give us analysis for the underlying shape. Let's make a, a concrete example here where we apply this, um, you know, we learn the implicit surface from multi-view images. And the key component like before is a differentiable renderer. Without explicit representation, the surface is rendered via ray tracing, which is an exp expensive operation itself. More importantly, as we sample the rays on the image domain, this, re this disregards the underlying 3D geometry. We can observe um, under samplings on certain regions of the surface and maybe over sampling other regions of the surface. This may lead to loss of details as well as errors in the topology. Another example is uh, to learn implicit functions, implicit surfaces directly from 3D point cloud. And probably as we see from the acquisition, maybe noisy 3D point clouds. The vanilla approach using implicit representation to overfit the input, noisy input, will give us very strong artifacts. And this is because there is no explicit geometry priors to filter out these noisy input. So what we want is a hybrid interchangeable representation between the implicit and the explicit. So that in addition to the topological and the resolution free uh, and infinite resolution advantages made possible by the implicit representation, we can also have a corresponding explicit representation, which are efficient to manipulate to and to analyze. So that eventually we can adapt the optimization process to the input data and the underlying geometry. The conversion from implicit to explicit already exists. And marching cube is the to-go method uh, for this purpose. However, its complexity grows cubically with respect to the resolution. Instead, we want the, res uh, the conversion to be online. So we need an efficient algorithm, not at the expense of surface details. So for this purpose, uh, we propose to use points. And we call these points ISO points as they live on the ISO surface. They are efficient to extract and they allow, allow spatially variant density if desired. And in the next part, I'll briefly walk you through the extraction of these ISO points. So the first step in the extraction is a projection step, which means that given an initial point cloud, let's say uh, initialized on a sphere, we use Newton method to project these points to the closest zeros of the sign distance field. Now this gives us a this you know second point cloud that probably have holes. So we have to fix these distribution artifacts from the projection. Um, by applying a uniform resampling based, uh, based on repulsion. And then um, after that, we reproject the points again using the Newton method. This gives us the, this third point cloud. And depending on the situations, we might want to have a much denser point cloud. So um, 
we apply the ideas from the edgeware point set resampling and inject points where the local sparsity measurement is the lowest or the sparsity measurement is highest so that the sparsest regions this uh, at the end of these three steps, we will be able to get a, a dense, uniformly distributed point cloud lying on the ISO surface. And so this process is uh, in the paper, we detail some, uh, some uh, adaptions from these uh, geometry classic point processing methods to um, consider the particularities from deep from neural implicit functions and to also to apply to GPU in a friendly in a GPU friendly fashion. Now back to the question uh, basically our motivation how do we use this this representation this complementary representation during the implicit optimization. So here I want to come back to the applications that I showed at the beginning where um, we talked about motivation. Um, the first one was multi-view reconstruction from images. Now, instead of using the ray tracing, we can use these ISO points that we generate, uh, we, we have uh, computed to generate samples on the surface. And the occlusions can be, can be resolved simply by using this point rasterizer we proposed before. And the ISO points, because they are uniformly distributed on the surface, the samples now we get represent the underlying surface with a higher fidelity. And specifically for optimizing sine distance function, um, it's uh, quite important to have these off-surface points uh, that you see here. And these off-surface points provide a strong supervision for the silhouette of the shape. And also to, it's, it's quite critical to stabilize the optimization. And because now we have these ISO points as, an, as a very um, accurate anchor to roughly describe where the surface lies, we can sample these surface off surface point more accurately. And in particular, create more of these in surface samples. This turns out to be quite important for um, to, to, to learn this uh, surface without, art, uh, without artifact. So if we compare uh, with the IDR, the Yarif paper, where only ray tracing is used to generate samples, uh, we can see that um, we, have, we can use our the ISO points to get rid of a lot of uh, wrong inner points. Um, so to get rid of the uh, topological errors um, basically shown in the inner structure of the ship. Then another thing we can do on top of just using uniform sample is that actually uh, we can think about sampling spatial in a spatially, in a spatially variant way to emphasize certain regions on the ship. So maybe we want to emphasize curvature, high curvature areas because maybe these areas are usually undersampled or maybe we can just apply the idea of hard example mining in training to um, get a metric on the on a point um, where the current loss is high, and then sample densely around that region. Um, and we tested these ideas, and we saw that actually the loss-based uh, idea is uh, quite um, uh, efficient. And if we compare the ray tracing. Um, ray tracing result with using uniform point clouds, uh, ISO points, we already see an improvement in terms of the detail reconstruction. Um, but then once we added this uh, adaptive important sampling based on the loss, we can see another, um, another update, another boost in the uh, details. And also um, here we show the training time uh, as well as the uh, the validation chamfer distance on these um, reconstructed surface, and we see that when we use ISO points, the error decreases more um, consistently and the convergence rate is faster. All right, 
And what about the application where we supervise train um, this implicit surface directly from noisy point cloud? So the input and the supervision is both noisy. Uh, it turns out that we can exploit the fact that usually the overfitting to the noise happens in a slower, in a in a later stage of the training. So we can extract ISO points at the early stage of the training and assume that these ISO points are typically smooth, as we see here. And then we can use these ISO points to, um, to um, apply some, to understand the geometry and apply certain priors, geometry priors. And one thing we try to do is to use these ISO points to compute where is the, which are the outliers of the input as you see here marked in red. And then these points in a supervision will give them a lower weight. So another thing we can do is that the ISO points, um, they can, we can use them to directly apply some um, explicit geometry priors or uh, regularizations such as normal consistency so we can force to, we can compute um, the normals from the PCAs uh, using these ISO points and then compare these PCA computing normals together with the normals we get from the implicit function and make sure they are consistent. This uh, gives us a higher or stronger prior on the smoothness as we can show here in this example. In summary, uh, these ISO points, they are, um, they are interdependent representations that can be used alongside with implicit representation. And so that on one hand, we can still keep the advantage of deep implicit representation for arbitrary resolution and topology. But on the other hand, we can perform some online analysis and manipulations of the, um, that's uh, made possible using these explicit representation during the optimization. Okay, um, I'm not sure how many time I have left, um, but I will hope I will be able to go through the last part in this uh, talk. I'm going to, so far, I'm so I have covered uh, three projects that concerned um, creating or constructing detailed 3D shapes from acquired data. Now the question is, can we use deep learning to assist 3D modeling? And so in this next project, um, um, we developed together with Adobe, we basically observed or explored this topic. Um, the goal of this topic is to achieve shape creation by deformation and in particular by detail preserving deformation. The idea is that given two arbitrary shapes without correspondences, uh, we want to deform one to match the other while preserving all its geometry details. In this example, we, cre we can create a detailed iron throw model here in a green um, by, by changing or deforming the iron throw model to match a a sofa shape um, so that you know the the iron sofa is now in a sofa model shape but it preserves all the detail that we we uh, the initial iron throw model has this can be used in design and it can be also used for character posing in animation and first i want to convince you that this problem is not trivial and if we just look at these two pair of chairs here on the left, and we want to deform one to another using previous method, we see some um, artifacts. This is because typically the previous methods are applied on the per vertex level. And um, another very key difference or key uh, challenge is that when we are deforming an object, we want to have two goals, which is if not competing, then definitely, um, you know, in some sense contradicting. Um, so the one goal being that we want to align this source shape to a certain target as close as possible. 
And then another, on the same time, we want to preserve the features of the input, input shape as closely as possible as well. Um, now, um, these two goals, they are, like I said, competing. But what can we do so that uh, we can somehow formulate this problem in a way that uh, this, these two goals can be reached in a, in a more you know, natural fashion? Our idea is to um, apply dimension reduction using cage deformation. And specifically, we represent these input and target shapes um, in a much coarser level as two coarse meshes enclosing the input shapes and output shapes. And then the deformation is only done on this um, cage level. So we, instead of deforming each vertex on a shape, we will just deform or translate the, the vertex on the cage. So this um, idea of cage deformation is not new. And in fact, it's a, it's a classic interactive shape modeling technique. The principle is very simple and elegant. Given a shape we want to deform, uh, we construct a coarse enclosing mesh around the shape. And once constructed, a shape and a cage are associated with the so-called cage coordinates. So that every point in a space can be expressed as an interpolation of the vertices of the cage using these coordinates. And a deformation can be simply driven by offsetting the cage vertices. The deformed shape is obtained then by applying the same linear function. While conventionally the cages are created by artists manually, here I will show you how we use neural networks to automate this process. Let's uh, consider the inference time for now. Um, given this, uh, well, a source and a target shape, we first use a very um, classic network, AtlasNet for point cloud processing to predict a source cage for this input, a condition on the source shape. And then having a source cage and source shape, we're able to compute this co cage coordinates differentially. And then another network um, sharing the weights can now sharing the weights with the previous cage net can then um, take in conditioning on the target shape. And now you can um, transform or translate each vertex of the source shape so that um, an offset is added to the source cage to finally give us the deformed cage. Now with this deformed cage, we can simply apply the same coordinates, cage coordinates we computed before, and this would give us the deformed shape. And because this interpolation is smooth by definition, the local geometry details can be preserved naturally. Now you may ask, how do we train this network? Because uh, how we don't know how the cages should look like. There is simply no training data for this. It's important to note that we don't supervise these cages in, uh, directly. Instead, we consider the key objective for the deformation, which is, well, one, good alignment between a source and a target. And then second, we want, um, we want good feature preservation, which, which is already partially guaranteed by this cage, um, by this cage formulation. So we apply for the first objective, this um, point to point distance measure uh, to enforce shape alignment between a target and deformed. Here we use the chamfer distance. And then another regularization on the cage coordinates to um, encourage a rigid, a more rigid uh, transform uh, deformation and to uh, serves as a regularization. And then um, specifically for some, for some type of shapes, we might have additional information, such a higher level additional information, such as symmetry and maybe preservation of normals in case we are dealing with handmade shapes so that these, well, high level future preservation regularizers can be added on top of uh, what we have already. So you see in this process, we don't need um, correspondences 
and this uh, training is almost no, we can consider it as a self supervision. Okay, so what uh, one advantage I would like to point out with this design is that because the deformation right now focuses rather on the coarse level, uh, rough shape um, deformation, the cage nets and deform net doesn't need to know the details um, of each shapes. So we, it allows us to actually input very noisy, sparse, or maybe incomplete data, uh, like these points uh, shown here, sample nouns chair. Oops. And, um, and this would give us the same result as, as if we use the entire mesh. Um, and also, exactly because of this, we can even process a very complex mesh as this chair itself by stun sampling um, to a very uh, significant degree before we input to the, uh, to the method. And now let's look at some applications. First of all, um, like we mentioned before, we can create more shapes by creating variations of existing shapes. And then secondly, um, as cage deformation is not strictly tied to the enclosed shape, we can apply existing deformation to a dissimilar source shape a technique often referred to as deformation transfer. But this typically requires, in a, so in a classic uh, methods, uh, classic methods to do this typically require uh, correspondence estimation, which is a complicated problem itself. And furthermore, being a per vertex, per vertex operation is also subject to detailed distortion. Um, in this example, our network is trained to deform a human in a rest pose to various other poses shown in green. And then when we want to transfer the deformation to another figure like this uh, skeleton and robot, we can just transfer the predicted deformation by optimizing the source shape, uh, source cage for this new character by ensuring that the coordinates are um, of certain um, hand-picked uh, or um, annotated pick, uh, vertices, uh, we will force them to be the same as the coordinates we have extracted before for the human body. This gives us roughly the same alignment between or the relation between the cage and the source shape. And then once we have that, um, we can then apply the same deformation we have learned using the neural network. Compared to existing works, this method doesn't require known correspondences between the target, between this target and the, and the shape, uh, the novel shape at the inference time. So in conclusion, this is a novel representation for deep deformation and it is detail preserving by construction and we can use it for creating uh, new shapes, detailed new shapes. So yes, this is so far we talked uh, about three projects that um, focus on constructing details from acquired data and then a project for facilitating detail driven shape creation using deformation. Thank you very much. And um, yeah, um, now it's time for, for questions. Thank you both for the, for the fantastic talks. And I know we are a little bit over time, but we will still stay for a couple more minutes for some interesting questions. And if you have other questions that we don't, we don't have time to cover and feel free to use our Discord channel uh, for further discussions. So first is a question for Marie Julie. So um, first, how do you obtain uh, those edge information at in the first place? Uh, so thank you. This is a interesting question. So um, the edge information is mostly there to represent intrinsic information, right? So in our pipeline, we use the edges from the um, template. So we have this uh, template of fixed connectivity on our point cloud and we measure the edges from there. But um, even if you didn't have that, you could measure any edges on your point cloud by using any uh, meshing or connectivity. Oh, okay. So perhaps you could use like K and grab and just get a, a set yes, of edges? Yes, you okay. can even do that. Okay, understood. And the next question is for Ifan. 
So uh, you have really mentioned about the those nerves paper like neural radiance field. And could you uh, comment out some, how do you uh, compare your point cloud-based differential render with those nerves-based uh, papers, except the complexity issue you mentioned? I think you're muted. Uh, Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks for the question. Um, I think um, I would definitely say that the NERVS paper, they have really demonstrated fantastic results, especially when it's com combined with neural rendering, uh, neural texture, etc. And I think um, to the, the, um, the difficulty with using point, um, besides um, being very flexible and maybe sometimes under regularized um, is that points we, we need to we need to have a sense where the points are on the image and this is usually well right now we are using this we're getting this information from uh, the rendered mask this alpha mask um, but if we don't have this background separation um, nerve paper because it's on based on radiance it's able to actually um, estimate uh, in the wild, even though there is no sense, uh, there is no previous knowledge, prior knowledge where the, the object lies. So I think on that regard, it's a very, uh, it's definitely uh, a um, advantage. And uh, I think the quality of the rendering we have seen that uh, if we consider the rendering, then um, you know, the radiance based function uh, is definitely together with the neural uh, texture, it's able to render in a, um, uh, with better quality for sure. Um, I do think that these two methods, the nerve paper and the point based methods, they can be combined. Um, and so one thing we, we considered is that actually the, the regularizers we propose, they can be maybe um, replaced with the implicit function um, so that you know these two can help with each other right on the one hand the regularizers from the implicit function will help the point to distribute nicely and actually form a surface on the other hand the point regular their point rasterizer is still faster and maybe can um, help with uh, like uh, the third project help with the optimization of nerve uh, itself yeah, that sounds like a very interesting idea based on your successful experience with the hybrid representation in your like, ISO points, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. And another question we have is for Marie-Julie. And uh, have you considered to preserve some uh, local rigidity such as like the as rigid as possible energy instead of just the edge lens? So um, the loss that we use is actually quite close to um, as rigid as possible energy, right? And uh, so we didn't uh, try explicitly over losses, but um, I think it should be possible to use over losses as a minimization. Okay, thank you. And there's also a question for Yifan. Uh, you mentioned that uh, Poisson surface reconstruction over smooth some noisy point clouds, and would there be any advantage of using a uh, like differentiable Poisson surface reconstruction so that uh, you can, like the model can learn uh, a point cloud that which uh, surface reconstruction can create a detailed surface? Oh, that's a very interesting idea. I, I haven't um, looked into this, but I think, yeah, I, this idea already sounds very exciting. I, I would definitely have a look into this. Okay, thank you. And that, that was the last question for both of you. So uh, both of your work tackles the problem of like structure preserving shape interpolation or deformation. And Marie-Julie's approach used like a local edge information and Yifang relies on like global cage-based deformation. So could you comment on each other's work on the benefits of using uh, this local versus global uh, approaches? Um, Yifang, do you want to try first? Um, yeah, actually, I think um, I think depending on the type of input application, um, maybe we want to look at different um, different approaches. I would say that um, um, 
these two approaches are complementary and can be combined. And when we looked at the deformation transfer application, we have, um, and we do see that even with cages, um, cage is not good at preserving. Uh, it does, it still have different, uh, defor it still have deformation artifacts, on, especially on the hand and these regions. And I could imagine this being addressed with Marie Julie's approach. Okay. How about you, Marie Julie? Do you have uh, any comments on comparing these two type of approaches? So I would say um, the local approach would be um, more useful if you have limited global information. So let's say that you don't have a, a mesh or a complete mesh or noisy points, for example. So, so that would be easier to smooth. But then the global approach would be easier if you have, let's say, semantic information. Let's say that you have some, some symmetries in your mesh and you want to uh, deform following that. It would be really difficult with a local uh, method like ours. Yeah, that's right. That's right. OK, so let me pull up the slides. So for now, that's a thank you, everyone, for joining this colloquium. And let's thank our speakers again. And we also want to thank uh, the artist Byron Eigen Swiller for making the poster on the left for this week. And next week, we'll be having a Yotam and Marik to talk about some interesting applications of like colors and geometry and also some interesting uh, casual 3D modeling. So see you all next week. <laughs>